Good morning, everybody. Uh, I welcome you uh, to our food webinar number two. It's a testinar because EU research projects have the possibility, the opportunity here to test their product ideas and market potential with our expert Sharon Knoll. My name, first let me introduce me to you. My name is Sylvia Schreiber. I will moderate this session. I come from the project CombiBiz and I'm responsible for the webinars and the catering for, of the projects. And uh, I'm very proud to introduce to you Mr. Sharon Knoll. He is a director from EFOST. This is the European Federation of Food Science and Technology. It's a platform of, I think, over 100 food uh, uh, institutions, so researchers, and research, uh, other research platforms. And Sharon uh, is based in Wageningen. This is in the Netherlands. He has a background as food scientist, academic background as food scientist. He is very experienced in food chemistry, but also in computer modeling and consumer affairs. And uh, Sharon will give, after each project's presentation, uh, evaluation and a reality check to the projects uh, in regard to their market potential and further development needs. Uh, I would propose that. Uh, after each presentation of each project, we have five projects to present this morning, uh, you as audience could ask uh, questions uh, via the written uh, chat function and Sharon or I could uh, interact then with you. So are we ready to start this webinar? Then I will move the first slide. Sharon will introduce uh, himself with a keynote on latest trends in food. Sharon, over to you, please. Okay, thank you. Ah, there's the slide. Okay, I think I'm control. Um, good morning to everybody uh, listening live, and also hello to all the people listening later back to this uh, questionnaire. Um, as introduced by Sylvia, my name is Jeroen Knoll. Uh, I'm director of EFOST, the European uh, Federation of Food Science and Technology. And EFOST is the European umbrella organization of the International Union of Food Science and Technology. And we connect approximately 100,000 professional uh, food science experts uh, through the 120 organizations that are affiliated to EFOS. And these are member societies, institutes, and universities. Um, these are located across Europe, of course, so most European countries are um, affiliated to EFOS. And these are only the member societies that I'm showing. So these are the IUFOS members. Uh, but of course, there are a lot of, of other universities and institutes that are affiliated to us and that we can uh, are amongst the EFOS network. Um, EFOS is, you can call it a dissemination organization. Um, we have set up three peer reviewed journals. Um, they're now published by Elsevier. Uh, I think one of the most known articles is Trends in Food Science. Uh, we also have affiliated trade magazines uh, like New Food. Uh, we have critical reviews uh, coming out together with Elsevier. We have our newsletter uh, that we send out to our member societies. Uh, of course, the EFOS website, the LinkedIn and Facebook and Twitter, social media that we use. And I think in relation to the Combis, uh, Combibis uh, project, an interesting thing is that we have a new journal a taste of science that is targeting uh, small and medium enterprises in the food sector. So this, this journal is, is trying to translate the latest scientific insights and, and possibilities that are there for small and medium enterprises operating in the food sector. Um, uh, it's a free journal. It's developed within a European project called Traded that we are um, involved in. Um, it's, it's free to access. Uh, it's called tasteofscience.com. So, Everybody, please have a look at it because it, I think it's interesting to, to be uh, kept up to date with the latest technologies. And I think uh, some of the projects that are presented here today would be uh, nice articles in, in Taste of Science. The title of my presentation of today is, 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 is about the future of our food and, and the challenges that we have in the field of sustainability and, and health. Uh, and I think most of the projects are targeting uh, also these challenges. 
Um, I would like to start with uh, the sustainability. Um, I think it's, in, in, and you can of course question what is sustainability, and I think in, in the end it comes down to that we maintain the way we can live and operate um, without using up our resources. And let me see there, because the challenges that we have uh, is that we have a growing world population and according to the statistics it will be about 9 billion in 2050 um, and at the moment we are around uh, seven, 6 or 7 billion people. So we have a growing world population, uh, we have to deal with climate change uh, and, and the effects of climate change in the production of our uh, resources. So it's also a, a challenging uh, thing, uh, especially if you look where, uh, which areas in the world are um, targeted to uh, negative changes in, in the future. So in the end we have, we have this, this world and, and, and some say we need, in 2015 we need two planets to feed uh, the 9 billion people. So we have this one world and with this one world we should take care of 9 billion people in 2015 and give them healthy and nutrition food. Um, and one of the challenges in, in, in this is, is the demand for meat and, and dairy products. Um, and if you look at the development in production of meat and dairy and consumption of meat and dairy, um, the projection is that um, within 2050 we need the production or consumption of meat will be twice as today. Um, and the same goes for dairy. So there will be a growth in, 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 in the demand for meat and dairy. But if you look at the impact of this chain, the, the, the meat chain, and then uh, at the moment it already produces, and, and, and then you can question if it's 18 or 20 percent, but almost one fifth of the greenhouse gas emission, uh, CO2 equivalents, is due to the meat production chain. Um, and 70% of all agricultural land is being used to produce our meat at the moment and almost one-tenth of the worldwide clean water is used for this chain. So if the meat production will double, uh, this will put very strict demands on, on how we go forward. Um, one of the solutions and I think the, the first uh, project um, is, is dealing with it already, uh, or let you me, is that we have to look for um, sustainable or alternative protein sources, such like these algae farms that can be both interesting for the, the bio, um, pro, uh, for the production of uh, other uh, energy sources, but also as a protein source for the future. Um, the same goes for using alternative protein sources like insects a uh, product that is currently in Belgium and, and the Netherlands on the market using insects as an alternative source of protein instead of meat. Um, but these are some of the challenges that we are facing. Also food waste is, is something that we have to, to look into. Um, um, if you look at the developing countries it's mostly within the, the primary sector you know, where most of the food is wasted and if you look to the developed countries it's in the end of the, the, the chain where the, the losses occur so at the projections, the processing stage or at the consumer at home um, and I think uh, uh, the, the project Sophie and um, Cafe and Susmilk are, are looking into this um, and also food security is an issue. Uh, if you look at the food availability um, and, and what is needed, um, so we produce around 3,000 calories per person per day. So this is what is produced. Um, what is recommended is around uh, 2,200 kilocalories that we consume. And the malnutrition line is around uh, a bit lower than 2,000 calories per day. And if you look then, then there are some areas, regions, where we 
consume or have too much food available. So it is also something to look into how can we change this. Um, so as a summary, uh, what are the, the challenges that we have on sustainability? We have to deal with a growing world population. Um, we have urbanization, so 70% of the population will live in cities. So this will also change um, the way the production change will, will be operating. Uh, we have growing prosperity, uh, and this means changing diet. So if you look at developing countries, they're adopting a Western diet. So their, their meat consumption is increasing. And we have to deal with the climate changes. Uh, and in the end, the food production must grow with 70% to feed the world in 2050. And of course, next to that we have to feed 9 million people, it should also be affordable and healthy food. And that takes me to the other challenge that we have, and the challenge of healthy foods. And it all started uh, with the Homo erectus, um, because the Homo erectus was the first one that processed their food. They, they um, cooked their food on, on fire, and through that, the nutrients in the food became more available. And so if you look at the difference between a primate and, and a human, a primate will have is about 17 hours per day busy on digesting its food and it, for a human it only takes two hours. So we have a lot of energy left over to to grow as a human and, and to look into other things. And, and our idea of, of nutrition and, and interaction uh, with health and, and well-being is, is changing and we we learn a lot more about this. Um, and if you look at the trends, you can divide it in market trends and consumer trends. Uh, if you look at the market, there is a big row in convenience products, easy to use. Um, we, there is an increase in fresh products, uh, so cut, cut products uh, already uh, ready to eat. Uh, there is a globalization, so, so diets, are, diets are changing. We have global, uh, global uh, uh, brands. Uh, we have diversification of channels, including internet, so it's another way how we get our food nowadays. Uh, organic products and fair trade play an important factor. Uh, people looking at more regional products or organic products, fair trade, so where does our, our food come from? And uh, of course, the out of home also is, is playing an important part, and also there we see a lot of products with more health claims. The consumer is also changing, so they are becoming more individual. Uh, they have a different lifestyle, uh, different way of where you consume your food. It's not that traditional anymore that you have these three meals per day and eat with the family. Uh, we have to deal with aging populations. We are getting older. Um, and also, we have an increase in chronic diseases, and this will also affect the diet. And of course, there is this consumer awareness about sustainability and social responsibility, and it is also increasing. And we have to deal with an increase in obesity and related diseases to tackle. So if you look at how the obesity trend is amongst U.S. adults, it's, it's I think, a, 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 an alarming trend. Uh, and this is also taking place in other parts of the, of, of the world. If you look, for instance, at the overweight children around the world, uh, it's not only in the US, it's also in Europe and in other parts in Asia where this is becoming uh, a problem. Um, next to the obesity, we have to look at how, what we consume on sugars, fats, um, and salt. Uh, I think salt has also got a lot of attention the, the past years, uh, and some countries are already taking measures to reduce uh, salt. Uh, for instance, South Africa is will have new legislations that will limit the salt per uh, product category. Uh, and I think some of the consumers are still not conscious about their salt product, uh, salt consumption. Uh, a nice study in the Netherlands showed that even the people of the Ministry of Health were not aware of how much salt they consumed. So during their lunch, they already consumed seven grams per day, where the recommended uh, salt consumption is five grams per day. So only with their lunch, and uh, they already exceeded this amount. 
So this is something, how, how can we challenge this? And also, I think we, the industry in, in the past, um, focused mainly on, on, on to, to make food as, as pleasing as, as, as possible. And uh, if you look at the formula, it's, it's, if you have salt, you have fat, and you have the satisfying crunch and pleasing mouthfeel, you have then a product that is designed to be uh, addictive. And so we have to see how we, can we change this, this way of behaving. Um, and I think interesting uh, books on this are from uh, shown here in the slide. And of course, some of the things that we have to, to, to also deal with is the, the lack of knowledge or maybe fear that consumers have for, for, for ingredients. I think a good example are the e-numbers uh, and that the consumer wants clean labels or maybe the industry wants clean labels. Of, or, um, and I think this is an issue where the consumers don't know exactly that e-numbers are supposed to be uh, safe. Uh, we, the European uh, uh, Union, have uh, have established these kind of e-numbers to, to show the public that these are safe ingredients that can be used without any problems in the products. No, so no health effects there. Um, and now consumers are becoming afraid of e-numbers, but I think some of the e-numbers are naturally occur occurring and should not be harmful. So there is also, I think, a uh, responsibility of the industry, the food industry, to inform consumers about how food are produced and why certain ingredients or processes are needed. Um, so some of the, cha the challenges, uh, again, summarizing is that we have change in consumption patterns. Um, for instance, in developing countries eating more meat, but also eating on, on different locations, consuming more, uh, for instance, liquid cal uh, calories. Um, also that you have the problem that energy dense ingredients are cheap, such as sugar, and that there is a trend for unprocessed foods. And I think the consumer is not aware of that processing sometimes is necessary to keep food healthy and safe, and that some of the processes are really not that dangerous as they think they are. Um, of, of course, we also have to, to challenge the decrease in physical activity. So the work that we are doing nowadays is changing. So we sit more behind desks doing desktop uh, work, not that more physical activity. So uh, there are a lot of challenges on, on the health aspect of foods, and uh, I think there are no simple solutions available. Uh, but of course, all the changes that we are making are, are needed. And I think that's why I end my presentation today. I'm looking forward to the presentations of the projects. Yes. Thank you very much, Sharon, for your very interesting uh, overview, Tour d'Horizon. And uh, I think this uh, addresses perfectly the topics of the projects we can present to you today. Uh, well, we start just with the first project. It's Euro legume, Euro legume. Everybody think I think knows these very very traditional plants, but you don't know about the latest signet, uh, secrets of the Euro legumes because they are hidden champions for the protein dilemma. Jerome just addressed there is a growing uh, protein hunger in the world with growing world population and coming up uh, emergency uh, emergent um, countries who uh, demand, uh, who have a higher protein demand and how to feed this is a very, very big challenge for food producers and for researchers and therefore the Eurolegume uh, project asks how can we make a more legume-based agriculture and they are working um, in their project on new grain cultivars for growing and breeding. They are working on new 
optimize inoculants for improved biological nitrogen fixation. These are fungi who go uh, to the roots of the, be of the beans and lentils and who, uh, who uh, are better for them to grow and, uh, for, and against abiotic stress resistance. And uh, they also uh, produce or they develop new uh, legume-based protein ready-to-eat foods and all new, also new legume-based fertilizers for the soils. So, what's the story behind? Oh, I'm one. Yeah, the story behind is that Europe heavily relies on imports of these very, very traditional plants like beans, peas, lentils, and others. 80% of the legumes consumed in the EU are imported. So, the project intense, uh, an increasing yield and an increasing consumption of legumes which are grown in Europe by developing new varieties which are more resistant to biotic and abiotic stress, uh, by developing new legume-based foods and feeds, and also to improve the resistance by these microorganisms uh, which we come, uh, will come to later to. Uh, the products of the project at the end will be a new seed with a better genetic diversity which could be uh, uh, made available to Europe in pea, fava bean and cow pea and uh, these new cultivars will be, uh, be provided to farmers. There will be new agri project, projects, so the new strains of uh, specific fungi, they will be selected to obtain market, marketable inoculants to improve the plant performance and the resistance in times of changing climates. There will be new feeds, uh, protein-rich um, frozen products and protein-rich snacks and normal meat for meals, meals for consumers, as well as highly digestible dietary protein sources for livestock. So not only foods, but also new field, feeds will come up and green fertilizer, so they will optimize harvest residues as sources for uh, organic matter and nitrogen to soils. So the research project, a uh, research process, process of Eurolegim is um, identify, uh, identification of new varieties, introduction of optimal inoculants, and the introduction of legume-based ready-to-eat foods to market according to consumer claims. Um, the Eurolegim development stage is uh, in the stage of upscaling. So uh, the researchers are about to produce, to, lead, uh, to, to uh, step up to the production threshold for novel frozen legume-based food product, products and snacks. And this is uh, being turned towards industrial production scale while they try to maintain product quality and safety. So they step up the volumes and the quantities of these uh, fro frozen new food products made from uh, based on legume. And the newly developed foods and feed products are being evaluated currently on microbial, microbial load according to European regulations of food safety. So, what uh, is the clients um, of uh, these uh, new products and also knowledge? So there, the research goes on phenological and physicochemical and genetic characteristics characteristic of these plants, of these legume plants, and this knowledge is interesting uh, to producer associations and breeding labs uh, to ensure a more sustainable and comp competitive farming activity. Also these optimized microorganisms, these fungi who are inoculants for the roots of the plants and their combinations go to companies working with these kind of uh, uh, microbia and cult cultures. Uh, the new food products, uh, which contain frozen legume products and snacks, go to agro-food industries and the new applications of legumes, uh, variety materials also goes to the livestock sector. So there are a whole variety and a whole range of clients from the agri-sector uh, to the agri-food chain to consumers. We turn the slide, yes. Um, 
the next clients uh, uh, will be attached, uh, will be um, uh, approached, and there will be uh, interaction with stakeholders on these questions about identification of new varieties, on the questions of introduction of these optimal inoculants, and on the introduction of legume-based ready-to-eat foods uh, for markets uh, and the consumers. The next steps of Euro-Legume is uh, know-how transfer, uh, transfer and uh, uh, knowledge to business strategy. So they need now, uh, the researchers need now to raise awareness uh, among companies on the economic value of the newly developed products. There are SMEs as well in this project and uh, they ask for a better EU stakeholders portfolio to apply for the new products and to sell and to spread them. So there is, um, I think, a lack of um, uh, EU uh, linkage and uh, therefore Combibis is there also to spread the word and to, and to make these very interesting new protein sources known. And my question to Sharon now is, how do you see the market potential of an actual very traditional food branch, but with the new prospects from the research we just have heard. Over to you, Sharon, please. Thank you, Sylvia. I think, um, as already also mentioned by you, it's, it's an interesting field because uh, there is this need for these sustainable proteins. And in the end, it was um, that you means are a traditional food that were consumed m many years ago as, as as one of the main sources for your proteins. Um, but I think the consumer lost the, the know-how of, of producing uh, legumes and also uh, I think there are some negative stereotypes about legumes, about how it's in your column, it's, it's processed and can lead to flatulency. Um, and and in my, my former job at Wageningen University, I was one of the areas that I was involved in was on sustainable proteins, also looking in, 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 in the potential of legumes. And I think the potential is there, uh, but this is something that you have to do with many stakeholders in the area, because if you look at the seed development uh, area, of course, there are some aspects where you can focus on, and I don't know in the Euro Legume project what the focus was. Was it about yield, about the taste, about the functionality of the proteins in there, or about the stability of the legumes? Uh, because if you look at legumes, then for food producers or, or processing uh, companies, it's interesting to see if this new type of variety of um, legumes are more stable or are uh, after th thawing, uh, after, after freezing and, and, and defreezing if there are more, uh, uh, the quality remains uh, uh, better. Um, and I think also we need, other stakeholders that we need are, for instance, the catering and retail industry. Because I think it's, if we can join all these stakeholders, produce, the primary producers that are producing the legumes, the food industry, the processors that are making the, 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 the tasteful frozen products, but also the retailers and helping understand the consumer and how to um, frame the, these products again as, as a new alternative for meat. Uh, so I, th that, I think that that's the challenge. Uh, and I think there are a lot of um, companies, SMEs, that are processing legumes uh, that are interesting to, to grow their business. So I think there there is this platform, but I also think we need uh, retailers to give uh, more attention to this product. Mm -hmm. So, uh, to summarize uh, in brief, um, Eurologym should demonstrate the added value of the new varieties and the new projects uh, which are in the pipeline already. Uh, that was basically, and they should involve more stakeholders uh, from the side of the food producers and the retailers as well. Could EFOST uh, uh, offer a, pro a project or a platform where these uh, SMEs uh, uh, could join? Um, yes, w one of the, the, the interesting projects uh, that could be a platform are Traded and Trafoon. 
And these are two platforms uh, that, that are funded in the same call, helping SMEs with their um, knowledge and technology transfer uh, and innovation needs. Um, so this is a platform where I think uh, more than 1,000 SMEs already joined and where there are brokerage events. So this can be a platform to get into contact with food producers that are seeing opportunities to, to use these uh, uh, legumes. Um, I think an another interesting area is the SME instrument in Horizon 2020 to mm -hmm. see if this uh, feasibility study, the stage one, or uh, could be interesting to team up uh, one um, producer, a grower of legumes with a food company to develop new concepts that are uh, not that traditional anymore, but try to see if there are new markets to um, I have to say uh, to uh, a new proposition explore, for yeah. to explore new yeah. new new product categories where where these protein sources are are used and to position themselves on the market for legumes with new and added value uh, products. Yes. Okay, thank you very much, Ron, for this um, uh, evaluation and assessment. I think this uh, helps a lot, and uh, of course, uh, Sharon. Uh, Sharon's email address is available uh, also at the end of uh, the session. Uh, I think we uh, go over to the next project. This is uh, Sophie. Try to control. Not yet. Yeah, here we come. Sophie. Uh, and again, yes, Sophie is about ready-to-eat meals. Also, uh, Sharon addressed this in, this in his uh, keynote uh, introduction, that the ready-to-eat meals and the consumer behavior, uh, eat on the go or consume on the go, is the trend of the future. And um, it is a, a challenge for food chain managers and food producers to of ready-to-eat meals and uh, fresh meals. And therefore, the project Sophie, they developed a prediction tool, an online prediction software, which keeps a watch, an eye on freshness for fresh cut salads and for fresh cut fruits. These were the model products of the project. And uh, Sophie developed in the uh, EU-funded project an online tool. Uh, it's ready in a demonstration ver demonstrator version. It works on ready-to-eat meals. It predicts a uh, life cycle of uh, these uh, tested products, and it builds on microbiological freshness. So what's the story behind? The, the freshness predictor, uh, Sophie, um, goes on this pre-packed fresh food uh, because there is a huge trend and uh, the healthy nutrition drives these sales and the food industry is challenged to ensure the quality, the safety, the high quality standard and it should offer also these products at affordable prices. 99, over 99 percent of food producers are SME and therefore they struggle to meet these requirements. The challenge is now to optimize the handling of fresh or minimally processed food like salad where the risk of pathogenic contamination is inherent and some incidents and outbreaks in the convenience uh, uh, sector have already occurred. And uh, to uh, avoid this, uh, it's most uh, helpful to have an online tool who tells the chain manager from the supermarket or from the uh, canteens or wherever uh, food is sold, um, on what stage the current product line or the current sales line is. The software tool is uh, web-based and uh, it allows immediately to see uh, parameters and indicators on food safety or on the shelf life, how the spoilage parameters change, how the water activity or the pH uh, value or the environments are going to change with uh, the timeline, and how the processing and packaging impacts the nutrition or the other features um, of this uh, produce. 
new and unique in SOFI is the combination of all three aspects, the food safety, the shelf life, and the processing and packaging, uh, packaging impact. So, and this offers new policy, policy possibilities also for product innovation. The online prediction tool is time and cost saving. It does not um, make lab tests um, uh, super fluent, but um, it, is, uh, it will uh, ease and optimize the lab testing by using this web tool, uh, web-based software before. So the research process uh, from Sophie was basically a modeling process. So they started with data collections on um, uh, um, different products and more than 2,500 data records mainly deal with pathogen, pathogenic uh, growth and um, also on the product behavior, safety, shelf life and quality. And they try to um, develop a user-friendly modeling database. Um, therefore, before an extensive consultation with the industry took place and also uh, desk research on scientific um, literature uh, brought uh, forward a huge range of product characteristics who uh, fed into this database and uh, who uh, finally uh, led to the mathematical models of the software. Sophie's development stage is um, on the demonstrator level. The team uh, was comprised for, uh, of manufacturers of fresh cut and deli salads, as well as of experts in food safety and software. And an advisory platform was built to invite a new stakeholder for further needs and adaptations of the tool. The future users and applications of soft uh, of the Sophie software uh, would be um, food manufacturers and also food chain managers the tools support them also in their raw material selection and the product formulation because if you have all these data available and the product behavior it is easier to find uh, for at the start of the chain the right product and to introduce it into the processing steps. So more than 200 food safety facts also were uh, produced in this product and they highlight uh, critical factors that need to be controlled using a wide variety of food processing and preservation techniques. Um, it is planned to extend this model to other food branches than salad um, and therefore Sophie's next steps go on this extension. They want to provide a platform and a marketing plan so that the basic software uh, could be provided uh, via membership to this, uh, via, uh, this platform to the members and the customization would then um, lead to some extra fees. Uh, they also work on an increase of user friendliness uh, to be ensured uh, that um, the software upgrades and um, has new features and is more user friendly and uh, Sophie is also working on a sales and marketing concept and they are looking for new projects uh, and new funding to do all these steps. So it is managed by TTZ in Bremerhaven and uh, Jeron, we are keen to hear your comment on this development. Over to you. So I do not have the tone. No, I'm going to switch on no. the microphone. Yeah. I think the interesting uh, about Sophie and the project is that already in the early stage they uh, included many stakeholders um, to check if there's something to be used by the foreseen food producers. Um, I think the interesting thing is to see the development of this tool as a commercial entity. Um, um, because I think in the end uh, it should be adapted or customized according to the chain of this producer. because. Every producer will have their own uh, raw ingredients uh, and there will be differences in there. We have these seasonal influences. Um, of course, there can be changes in, in, in uh, suppliers of raw ingredients. So I think this it should be clearly how to adapt the tools to the individual company using the tool. Um, and I think that, that's where I think the, the interesting business model is, is to see 
how this tool can reduce uh, the cost for the single producer by reducing the food waste or increasing the food safety or the quality of the product. Um, so I think the, f the focus should be now on the, on the next step of what are the benefits next to the, the food safety and the, food and, 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 and the quality aspect, but what are the financial benefits of incorporating this technology in a, in, in a company. Um, there was one um, concern if um, food producers or chain managers would be ready to pay a price uh, for that because uh, there are so many tools available already for free on platforms. Yes. Do you think a business case? Uh, is there, do you think there is a business case? Uh, I think there is. Um, I, I know that there are uh, developers of, of, of uh, modified atmosphere packaging that have the tools and facilities to to test the what kind of uh, packaging film you have to use to to extend the shelf life of products. Um, but is that that is only one aspect of of of, of the product, uh, and this goes further back into the chain uh, about assessing. The, the, the quality of the raw ingredients um, and in the hand in the end if this tool will help to reduce uh, product failures or, or extend shelf life or to have a better idea of the shelf life and, and to, to um, enhance the, the, the food safety standards in the company um, I think that there will be an, an additional benefit and mm -hmm. of course this will uh, have its price. I think there, there is, uh, uh, yeah. So I, I, I do see the potential here, potential here. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, could you also say, is there also this SME instrument interesting as a new funding uh, source for Sophie, or um, do you see other aspects in Horizon 2020, or some regional funding also could be interesting? What would be the best for them? Um, I think ne next to regional funding, uh, the, the European uh, SME instrument could be of, of interest, but of course sometimes it's more easy to find national funding um, uh, and, and the, changes, the, the, the chance of, of uh, getting uh, funding on national uh, programs is maybe higher than in Horizon 2020 platforms. Mm -hmm. um, so if there of course is uh, one of the consortium partners finds uh, an, an another company uh, in the country that is willing to 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 go the the next step. I think that is one of the the, the things that they could uh, look into. Uh, but I think the consortium as a whole, as it is a European project, should also look into to the possibilities within Horizon 2020. Mm -hmm. um, and that can be the pilot stage uh, programs that are or the or the SMEs and instruments that that are available. So in any case, they should uh, proceed and go on. <laughs> yeah. Yes, I think if if there is a, a food a food company that is willing to to um, incorporate this, then it's they're launching customer, uh, and because then they can also show that the, the real benefits of it, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. the financial benefits. Some, some, finding some benefits and maybe also highlight the added value um, against uh, already existing uh, products. Yes, if, if, if there is a, a launching customer that is willing to use this tool and he can show how he or she is benefiting from using this tool uh, with regard to uh, the, 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 the shelf life, the food safety and the quality aspects, then this can be a demonstration case that is very uh, could be the next thing to to get the other food industry uh, companies on board. Yeah, on board. Yes. Okay. Thank you very much, Sharon. <laughs> Uh, thank you very much for this uh, reality check <laughs> on Sophie. And we go on to our next project. It's the project Bacchus. It combines two features or two items. Uh, Jeron uh, touched uh, in his introduction. It is health uh, and health and also uh, modern food, uh, which is the bioactive compounds. It's healthy food, and it is uh, yes SME who go for new products to meet the modern 
uh, lifestyle and modern consumers. So the Bajos project um, is um, on uh, research on bioactive compounds for cardiovascular health. And um, it is uh, on berries, wines and chocolate, uh, things, foods we all like. And they are not tasting only good, but they also contain uh, bioactive compounds that may help uh, to promote the health. They could slow aging and they could reduce the risk of many diseases, including cancer and cardiovascular disease. So uh, the bioactive compounds um, are about to be extracted and to uh, used from food SMEs for new products. And uh, the uh, uh, hot candidates, these compounds, the hot candidates are polyphenols and peptides, and uh, they can be um, merged into dairy products or cereals, uh, but to, to do this and to claim that they are healthy products, so these food SMEs need some support to formulate the scientific evidence that proves that the health claims are um, um, correct on the product. Bachus um, is developing tools for this and also resources which can be used to exploit the scientific evidence on uh, the uh, polyphenols and um, peptides and uh, these tools can support the SMEs to apply that they can have a health claim label on their product and this health claim label also has to prove that there is a relationship between the consumption of the bioactive peptides and the polyphenols and the beneficial effects related to cardiovascular health. Um, but facilitate this application process to the health claims which have to be handed in at EU institutions uh, to get these nutritional product labels on the products. And uh, the first question uh, of the food uh, producer to one, uh, who wants to use these bioactive compounds in his product is the question, can I make a health claim? And uh, the story is that the EU uh, legislation was uh, enforced in the last years to make sure that the health claims which are made on the products uh, are uh, rigorously tested, that they are transparent and valid. So the Bachus um, uh, toolkit enables SMEs and other stakeholders to follow these standardized uh, guidelines which are uh, necessary to follow to ease uh, the, the um, application process and to meet the regulators requirements. The Bachus product therefore is a, a tool database and guidelines kit. Uh, it should be user-friendly and a single product for the SMEs uh, to help them to better understand the procedures and the protocols which are required to enable them to bring health claims to their product. So the product, this single toolkit comprises a best practice guide uh, which contains the dossiers and uh, the requirements for human diet dietary intervention studies. It also contains an e-based database uh, which is international recognized and which shows the composition and health benefits of bioactive compounds in many, many different foods. This is uh, up-to-date scientific information and it is constantly updated and it can be used also via the web. And finally, it has a third component. It is the so-called CREAM Global Interface and it is a tool which allows the calculation of intake of bioactive compound in the diet which is needed to support the health. The research process um, is um, um, to shape these tools to help the SMEs. The consortium of Bachus is composed uh, of 12 uh, research and technology centers and 15 uh, SME which directly try to develop food products uh, that pursue health claims and which also are candidates for a EFSA regulators procedure. Therefore, 
the process um, was actually uh, shaped by case studies, which are aligned to the EFSA scrutiny. So the existing SME developed products that have clear potential for obtaining the favorable opinion of the EFSA to get health claims on the product and to be select. And these were selected, these SMEs and their cases were selected um, at the Bacchus product to uh, complement the study. Each part of the project addresses key aspects of the EFSA health claim evaluation process. So they will work down the protocol uh, on legislation and dossiers to hand in on product and bioactive characterization, on habitual intakes, on bioavailability of the compounds and uh, stuffs inside um, these and the mechanism and biomarkers also and their, their uh, SMEs who apply for a label have to demonstrate in clinical trials the evidence of a health benefit and uh, Bachus delivers the tools and uh, the high quality science and also the processes. So the SME will be supported to submit better health claims dossiers on EU level. Development stage of a Bacchus project is on pilot stage. Uh, it is ongoing until September 2016 and the services and tools are still um, uh, under development, though, so they are not on the market yet, but Bacchus uh, future clients and applications, the clients will be come from food industry, especially SME, but also uh, associations. And um, in order to fully implement the toolkit in the industry with focus on SMEs, Bacchus would need to extend the testing to a wider group of users and carry out more evaluations. The next step, focus on that. So the updated tool will be released in a beta version. Clients will uh, be identified and the BIS plan will be developed. The modules and tools therefore will be fine-tuned. Uh, the sustainability plan including income and revenues and um, uh, maintenance will be worked out. The toolkit uh, will um, also further be developed to find funding and uh, they will get uh, and they will get to try to get sufficient SMEs on board to take advantage of these tools and ensure it provides useful information for their work. So there is a whole range also on benefits in the pipeline yet, not on the market, but to see. And uh, I'm curious what Jerome's opinion is about that. Over to you, please. Uh, thank you, Sylvia. Um, yeah, I think it's they're addressing an important issue because I think for SMEs it's very difficult to obtain health claims. Uh, it's a lengthy process, uh, also an, a, a difficult process for most SMEs. Um, so helping SMEs going through this process is very interesting. Um, I think it would be nice to see how the first cases that have been uh, developed within the, 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 the tool, the Bacchus tool, what the final outcome is regarding their health claim. Uh, because if you have, if you can ha showcase the successful application of a health claim by one of the SMEs, it will help in, in, in building this tool and further developing this tool and, and branding the tool. If there is a proven track record. If there is a proven track record. And I think in this case, I, 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 from the, the, the information you just showed, I cannot see that at this moment, but if there is a proven track record, this will help. Um, yeah. um, and I think um, for further collaboration, I think it's interesting to see the, na the national collaborations um, because healthier products can lead to an increase in, 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 in revenue. Uh, also, of course, you are helping um, to have the, 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 the people in your country to, to eat more healthy, but also the, the, the industry will grow if they can sell more healthy products because they will generate more revenue. Um, so I think for most countries in Europe, it's an interesting field to develop more more products that are uh, have health benefits. Um, so I think companies, SMEs, should should look at national funding to see if they can uh, use the Bacchus tool to go through this whole process of, of filing an, an ESA claim. Mm -hmm. 
Mm -hmm. So it also has a political uh, dimension for a food industry or for a country which is strong dependent on food industry to improve the process uh, of uh, healthy food labeling and this has to go we are the EFSA and the EU regulators and the Bachus tool could uh, be the support if they can demonstrate yes uh, by, by using these tools and these data and these uh, protocols and guidelines uh, you will be much more successful as food producers to receive this and to obtain the label. And this could yes. be in the interest of a, of a country which is uh, strong in food production. Yes, if you, if, you, if you look at Europe, I think countries as, as France and Spain uh, could could contribute very well from, from the health benefits uh, that are uh, obtained from the, from, from the wine. Mm -hmm. um, so it can support the, the, the wine industry in, in Spain and, and, and uh, France, Italy. If there are, if you can extract the health, the, the components that are mm -hmm. have a health benefit, and and, and uh, form a new business. Yeah, they would love to hear that. <laughs> Thank you, <laughs> Sharon. Very good. Uh, let's move on uh, with our next project. It's called Cafe, and we enter here now the uh, food processing in a narrow, narrower sense. The Cafe project. Uh, deals with high tech and it aims uh, on a better quality and more safety for processed foods. So to ensure good taste, attractive texture, freshness and less waste, uh, CAFE says a smarter control technology for food tech, uh, factories and food processing uh, will be necessary. And uh, therefore the project looks uh, at um, analytical uh, technologies and sensors which can improve to stabilize and better preserve processed products. And um, as we saw uh, former in the SOFI project, um, uh, they also used uh, model products and these were dairy products beer, ice cream and wine and let's see how they dealt with and treated these products to optimize them and to have a constant quality because raw materials vary but the computer expects from a brand or from a product always to have the same properties and qualities. How did they go on? So the cafe, uh, cafe story is about ensuring uh, constant quality uh, against natural raw materials which are of course the base for good food products but uh, have a, a variation in their properties and behave differently when, when they are processed. So for instance uh, when wine uh, or beer is fermented there can come out very different qualities or if ice cream or cream is frozen to produce ice cream or uh, to produce a milk product, it can behave very differently when the heat or other process uh, parameters work on these raw materials. Or also when uh, fermented products are converted through bacteria and enzymes, when uh, cheese uh, is made for instance, it call also can influence the um, uh, source or the base product very, very differently. So cafe first uh, looked um, uh, at these uh, foods and tried to abstract models and then to uh, develop tools for the industry which allow to control these processes when you deal with natural pro uh, products. CAFE stands for Computer Aided Food Process for Control Engineering and the CAFE product at the end is know-how to control devices and some uh, 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 to uh, develop control devices and some tools. So the researchers offered sophisticated models for a fine-tuning of physical parameters such as heat or temperature while frying, freezing, filtering or transforming the raw materials to good foods. Uh, CAFE developed software tools and also high-tech sensors uh, which allow precise and effectively steered processes in the food factories. It's high-tech control for food factory. The research proce process was modeling and studies. So the main focus was to have a unified view on the design of control tools to the wide diversity of food process. This is one um, um, thing which 
also I learned uh, while I was uh, tackling uh, this uh, cafe uh, content that uh, there is a wide variety and you have to abstract on some basic principles, some paradigms and common markers for the control process in food making. And uh, they looked on, for instance, crystallization of the ice cream, which is a structuring um, paradigm, or they looked how to optimize the wine fermentation, which is the principle of bioconversion, or they looked on microfiltration filtration of beer, this is the separation principle, or the freeze drying of lactic acid bacteria in the cheese production, which touches uh, preservation issues. So variety condensed to four down to four basic principles for the industry to uh, develop control tools. And the development stage is proof of concept and pilot scale processes, but there are also market ready tools. Proof of concept and validations for production paradigms on ice crystallization and wine uh, fermentation is uh, done and it is developed and tested um, some sensors and a control tool which is ready to go to the market. And uh, the applications and the clients is uh, food industry and applications for this industry. So CAFE offers concepts and tools for more efficient control of food processes, not only to ensure the quality and safety for the consumers, but also for the producers to achieve better covering of operation costs, uh, savings of in energy and water consumption, and to meet environmental requirements. The client is the food industry which wishes to optimize the process. The next steps. It will be a demonstrator project. Um, therefore, talks to industry have started or should be started soon with partners uh, in order to initiate a complete implementation of these developed tools, the sensors and also the software. And SME partners of the CAFE pro project should be involved um, to start a demonstrator project which needs, of course, new funding. So it's not very simple for a lay <laughs> to understand, but when it comes down to these basic principles, uh, one could uh, imagine that the food industry could benefit and also uh, some uh, countries who are who have a lot of SMEs also could benefit uh, from a more effective food procession. procession. Uh, Sharon, I hand over to you and I'm keen to hear your comments. Okay, thank you very much, Sophia. Um, I think the, the interesting challenge that they address is, is by controlling the quality through the processing you use the food waste in the end um, and also maintain uh, a certain quality during uh, the year. Um, I think what is of interest is that the technology readiness level at the moment is uh, I think on, on level five or six mm -hmm. uh, and I think for the next step if, which also is, is uh, set by the project is to go to, to, to level 7 to, to demonstrate this in an operational environment. Um, what I question, and I think, this, I think this is interesting to discuss, is, is if this technology for which, which size of SME it's, it's of interest. Because incorporating such a, 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 a system where you have these high-end sensors and modeling uh, I think you have to adapt this for each single process. Um, so the SME interested in this technology should have the resources and capabilities to implement this. On the other hand, the incorporation of this system should be of financial benefit because if you have this high-end system controlling your quality, but it costs too much, the, in the end the product becomes too expensive. Mm -hmm. So. I think one of the discussions that they would have within CAFE is which size of company is of interest for having this kind of high-tech uh, modeling sensors. Um, I think of course for the, for the different cases that they have shown um, for the ice cream and beer, so they should define okay, what is a reasonable size of the company, how much should they produce uh, per hour or per per week uh, mm -hmm. for this for these tools to be um, uh, of interest. Mm -hmm. So definitely, it will be uh, for bigger 
uh, food manufacturers, not so much for the tra traditional manufacturing or uh, crafters. No, I think for, for, for the, the beer, uh, if you look at uh, one of the cases is, is, is beer, uh, if you look at beer, and uh, I think the traditional beer crafters, this, this technology uh, will, will not be uh, of interest. Um, because it's too expensive for... Uh... I think, uh, yes, and, and that's of course uh, difficult to assess at, at this moment, but I think it will be too expensive for, for the, the, the benefits that it will have. I think for, for larger producers there will be benefits. I think for smaller, uh, smaller producers um, it's, I think the, the benefits will not outweigh the, uh, the, the investments that are needed. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. So I think so within uh, getting to the next stage they should have a clear idea what type, how, sh how big should the companies will, uh, be to work, uh, to work with. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Be more focused. So is the message to cafe. Be more focused on, on what what yeah on what size of company. Um, mm -hmm. Because if you can demonstrate it on that uh, in, in, in those type of companies and it, it is a system that is working, then you can further develop it and maybe the costs are be, will be lower and then you can always go to the smaller scale producers. But I think they should focus on getting. Uh, a medium-sized or a larger company that is willing to invest in this mm -hmm. and to demonstrate okay. it and if the demonstration and the technology readiness level is, is increasing to seven eight then they can focus on, on, on the smaller uh, producers producers okay yes. thank you very much for this uh, valuable evaluation Jeron um, we stay in the food technology sector and go on to the SAS milk pro project SAS Milk deals with milk, as the title already says, and with a very traditional industry, it's the dairy industry. So green dairies um, ask, for, ask the question how yogurt and cheese can be produced more sustainable. And SAS Milk develops, therefore, new components which are eco-friendly and which can be used in existing dairy infrastructures. The objectives of the projects or of the new technologies are savings in energy, water, CO2 emissions and cost. And SAS Milk developed for uh, this purpose a green dairy net as an open innovation platform, which is also interesting as a new method um, to assemble new clients or new interested parties and to have a constant feedback in your innovation process and development uh, routes. So the story behind um, is uh, of a uh, uh, vast uh, challenge because uh, our milk industry is one of uh, the biggest sectors in the food production. It's a real heavy weight. And 13% uh, uh, of all turnovers in total food and drink in Europe are produced in the dairy industries. There are 140 million tons of raw milk every year which are proce processed and a huge amount of gigawatt hours and energies are needed and therefore SAS milk uh, benches over uh, the challenge to redesign this very traditional sector and uh, looks at the whole milk processing infrastructure to minimize energy and water uh, consumption and to do a sea change in the next years to come. The product of SAS Milk is a three-pillar solution with Ecotrack tech processes and waste treatment. The first pillar looks on energy converting technologies that are spanning heat pumps, absorption chillers and solar heat technology or biomass heating. So steam is substituted by hot water which really uh, should lead to an energy saving of 50% uh, and to a, a saving in water consumption by 30%. The second pillar is a new milk processing through pre-concentration of milk to save water and transport energy so the volumes are lowered um, and uh, this leads to a concentrate, uh, concentrate, uh, concentrated product and this can replace high temperature evaporation and means less stress for the milk and hence a better milk quality.
The third uh, pillar looks at the dairy wastes. So it is a new recycling change of water by a clean in place process and the recovery of chemicals from these processes. The organic load fraction of these waste is uh, um, used to produce biogas, bioethanol or lactic acid production is also investigated which can be also uh, used then as a, a raw, uh, raw product for uh, other, other preservation methods. The research project, um, a research proce process um, aims at new tech installations and testing um, uh, in, I think, five countries. Currently, our 21 partners uh, working in SASMILK uh, from Technology Institute and the dairy in the industry uh, to reach this more uh, resource efficient uh, production. And um, also part is life cycle assessment of the concept and the components and the transfer of the findings into an online tool for dairies because also here the whole sector is mainly composed composed of small and medium enterprises. This tool, this online tool, will allow these smaller dairies to check their individual potential for energy and water savings and to liaise to the researchers or one day to the SME how to optimize their production. And it is the non, not one size fits all approach, so each dairy has its, its different processes and infrastructures and uh, this is uh, to meet by the um, suppliers of this technology. The development stage is uh, in different levels, so the technologies are at level 6 to 8, the heat pumps and the chillers or the solar panel panels. Then the concept is on level four, so it is a pilot stage and a prototype, but not a demonstrator yet. Also, this chemicals recycling or the water recycling is on level four to five. And the process simulation and assessment of the green dairy, this online tool, is on level six. So it is not the rollout, but it goes maybe to the beta version soon. And we have then the clients, it is the milk processing industries and the dairies and uh, the applications are uh, described yet. Um, the, it is uh, process engineered components and it is this open innovation tool called Green uh, DairyNet where um, uh, uh, dairies and milk producing companies can join and register and um, yes, it lives from the participation of its members. Next steps uh, of SASMILK is marketing. The technologi uh, technological developments can be used already by enterprises. Um, the developed simulation will help even small family-owned dairies to optimize their process change uh, once they are on the market and uh, online tool will be uh, on the way to its marketing uh, for better efficiency assessments. So far from the SAS milk developments, components, online tools and these platforms and uh, we listen to Sharon what he thinks about the green dairy infrastructures to come on the market soon. Over to you. Thank you. Uh, I think it's an interesting project uh, because I think in, in different ways the, the dairies and, and, uh, and milk producing uh, milk processing uh, facilities can, can lower their, their uh, energy use and, and water use. Um, the question that I have is that the project focusing on all sizes of uh, companies, on dairies and, and, and uh, processing plants. And I think there, there is some, some, some challenge because um, within the trade project and also in the Trafoon project, it was in, identified that many small and medium and indeed the, especially the small uh, enterprises have difficulties of um, getting small scale uh, processing equipment. Uh, and I think it's of interest to see what kind of equipment on what kind of scale these uh, equipment are available, for instance, for the farmers to uh, for the heat exchange pumps or because there there is of course this this, this balance between how much do I invest uh, invest in equipment and what is the return um, and for for small producers 
most of the times the equipment cost is relatively higher um, to invest in than for bigger companies because um, it, it will cost more to produce a small scale uh, uh, equipment than, than large scale equipment. So it's, it's relatively more expensive for small scale producers. But I think this is the interest to see if in the in the tool that they are developing to see if you can select the size of your uh, company, which is how much milk do you produce on, on, on a year basis, to see, okay, if I produce this amount of milk, then these technologies are of interest. So that, that you can 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 change the variables and the parameters to see what kind of technologies are of interest. So if it's interesting to, to invest in solar panels, is it interesting to invest in a heat exchange pump? Um, you know, I think this should be an important aspect of, of the tool. That mm -hmm. producers can indicate their scale and that this, this is influencing the outcome of the assessment tool. So you recommend a module-based approach for the producers. My question, uh, Sharon, also would be um, one of the last questions because we come to an end with the testinar now, but is the dramatic fall in milk price, are the dramatic fall in milk prices in Europe, um, are they going against more innovation in this traditional sector? Uh, I think so, yeah, because at, at the moment uh, the milk prices are so low that investments in new technology, I think they will be hold off at the moment. Mm -hmm. So this, this, it should be clear that if you invest in these kind of technologies, in the end you will benefit from, from a, a lower water use or a lower uh, uh, energy use. Um, but it, it, I think and maybe in, in the module the, 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 the milk price should be also one of the variables that you can play with to see okay, what kind of milk price is needed to have these uh, energy efficient uh, practices uh, paying off. Mm -hmm. uh, and another, I think, uh, one of the things that they're looking to is, is in concentrating the milk. Uh, and of course this is also interesting because what kind of size do you have to, uh, what kind of, what is the size of the, the farm to have this um, concentrating facilities on the farm to be more effective because then you have to look at, at the whole chain. So if, if it's collected on the farm and brought by, by, by trucks to, to a central um, processing facility, is the new way of concentrating on the farm and then moving it to, to, to the local, uh, to, to the hub where it's processed, is this energy more energy efficient mm -hmm. than to the old process where the milk is collected every three days and then brought to the factory? So I think there are some some challenges they have to, to look into if it's all if it if the energy um, profit or, or, or reduce the energy okay. reduction uh, is also cost effective. Okay, it's actually as always. A weighing, a balancing, and a weighing uh, yes, of is. the variables. <laughs> yeah. But I think it's important to have these variables already in the assessment tool. That that mm -hmm. uh, a farmer can decide on. Okay, this is my size. This is my price. Uh, these are my operating costs. And then in the end, it will get a result. Okay, these are the technologies that are of interest. Yeah. Thank you very much, Sharon. Very good uh, evaluations on very good comments and uh, reality checks for all these uh, contributing projects, to which I also uh, say my uh, warmest thanks. Also thanks to the audience. I don't see uh, any contributions of uh, chatters, so actually we tackled all open questions. And uh, thanks again, and we are looking for the next testina, which will be begin of next year. Goodbye to everybody. Goodbye. Goodbye.